Welcome, Annie, bonjour. Welcome to Massey College. Mon nom est Nathalie Desrosiers, and I'm the principal of Massey College. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to our inaugural Irvina Bella lecture on the role of history. It's a real pleasure to have all of you here. And thank you to the Honorable Rosia Bella and her son, uh, Josh and Zachary, to be here. As we honor, <laughs> as we honor a great historian uh, with another great historian. So I first want to recognize that we are on indigenous lands, the lands of the Yonwendat, the Seneca, and it is the treaty land of the Mississaugas of the Credit. I want to acknowledge our duty of stewardship toward the land and also our great privilege to be here. My role today is to introduce our speaker and also thank our sponsor, Marshall and Judy Cohen, for their support for this lecture. Because of uh, health and immunity issues, they cannot be in the room with us, but I know that they're watching, and, and I want to say thank you, uh, Marshall and Judy, for uh, helping Massey College and supporting this lecture. Now, why are we having this lecture? Now, uh, Massey, like all institution, is looking at his history, and I know that uh, it means something to have uh, uh, the Irving Abella lecture at Vincent Massey's place. Uh, and I feel a little bit the same way as I did when, uh, for the first International Women's Day, I invited the, the women who had marched in front of Massey College when uh, the place was not open for women uh, until 1973. So uh, it was kind of fun to invite the ones who had debated admissions to Massey uh, to be here. And today I think what we want to do is we want to have a, a lecture in, in the name of Vinabella, I think, to celebrate his career. And uh, uh, very generously, I received this CV today. And uh, just to remind you a few of his uh, accomplishment, Johnny MacDonald Book Award for, by the Canadian Historical Association for the best Canadian history book, For None is Too Many, the Joseph Tenenbaum Literary Prize for None is Too Many. He also ha was a member of the Royal Society, the Order of Canada, the Honorary Doctorate of the Law Society of Upper Canada, of Bishops, of Western, Distinguished Lifetime Achievement Award by the Association of Canadian Jewish Studies. I also remember that CCLA, the Canadian Civil Liberties Association, gave him an award of merit. I guess he forgot to put it in here, <laughs> but uh, it's one of the most prestigious awards. And also, uh, you know, and also all his incredible contribution to academic life and to our Canadian society. He was chair of the Governor General's Literary Awards for Nonfiction, president of the Canadian Historical Association, president of the Academy of Arts and Humanities of the Royal Society. Uh, President of Kenyan Jewish Congress, Chair of Vision TV, Chair of the National War Crimes Committee, Director of the Goldfarb Corporation, and Director of the Schwartz Reisman Foundation. So I think we are celebrating uh, his contribution as a great historian and as a great academic. It's very important for Massey College to reflect the role of academia and the importance of it. And I also thought that it would be a real inspiration to our junior fellows, many of them are here, um, to know that sometimes research matters. And indeed, the story of uh, None is Too Many is that indeed, sometimes people read your book and your work. You have to do it, you have to do it well. And then having somebody, Ron Atke, the minister, read it at a time where it mattered and instead of the only 5,000 Jewish refugees uh, that came during World War II, he allowed 50,000 Vietnamese boat people instead of the 8,000 that initially had been uh, planned. So it's a book that mattered. It's a book that changed many lives. So for all of us that uh, got to know uh, Irvina Bella, it's with great admiration and great affection that we want to have this lecture. Et c'est mon grand plaisir de présenter le premier conférencier Irvin Bella, professeur Chad Garfield. 
Chad Gaffield is a distinguished university professor, professor of history emeritus at University of Ottawa. He holds the university research chair in digital scholarship. And as we know, we knew him very well when he was president and CEO of the Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada from 2006 to 2014. He was also the president of the Royal Society of Canada. He's an expert on sociocultural history of the 19th and 20th century. And he has been at the forefront of efforts to develop digital technologies to expand, deepen, and facilitate good, excellent historical research. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He received in 2004 the G.B. Terrell Historical Medal for Outstanding Contribution to the Study of Canada and was awarded the International Alliance of Digital Humanities Organization Antonio Zampoli Prize. He's also a, has a Doctor of Law Honoris Causa from Carleton and he was an, appointed an Officer of the Order of Canada in 2017 and now He's just uh, uh, dealing again with university life as he's been appointed as the U15 Group of Canadian Research Universities Chief Executive Officer uh, since 2022. Uh, Chad, Professor Garfield, merci beaucoup d'avoir accepté notre invitation. Please, I want to say as well that uh, this lecture is being recorded for uh, the, emission, the uh, uh, ideas uh, CBC is our partner in many uh, events, and we're delighted that they uh, agreed to tape this lecture that will then be available to all Canadians. Alors, merci beaucoup, Chad, on machines and minds, pursuing inclusive history in a turbulent world. Chad. Well, thank you so much for that. Uh really warm and generous introduction. You know, when Pam Gaffield uh, and I often, we think about, um, just reflect on life, and the thing that jumps to our mind is how lucky we are. Uh, and I can't tell you how uh, extraordinarily lucky we feel to be here today and to see all of you. I'm just so touched, and, and uh, I just want to emphasize uh, to you how meaningful this is for uh, a, a variety of reasons. and, and um, En fait, euh, je voudrais euh, d'abord remercier Nathalie en, et euh, en fait euh, euh, vous féliciter. Je pense que jusqu'à date ici, euh, comme principal à Massy, on a vu le nombre d'activités augmenter vertigineusement et euh, il y a tellement d'animations et euh, il y a un centre ici maintenant qui touche en fait et je regrette beaucoup le fait que nous sommes à Ottawa et c'est assez difficile de fréquenter uh, tous ces événements, mais uh, we feel so lucky uh, to, to uh, uh, be here. And um, Honorable Rosie Abella, uh, you know, it's, it's just so, you know, I think about uh, the fact that my name came to your mind when you were thinking about who might be the first lecturer, it really is amazing. And uh, last week we had a, a chance to spend some real quality time with, with Rosie and, and uh, to see JJ and, and Zach in the, in the terrific film that was the, kind of shown for the first time in Ottawa. And if you haven't seen it, you know, Supreme Life of, of Justice Rosie Abelli, you must see it. It's a, it's a human, family, uh, Canadian story that is just uh, there wasn't a dry eye in the house, and this is the Bytown Theatre, which is enormous, uh, as, as you know, and it was just such a, a pleasure. But I must say, Rosie, um, you know, Pam and I have had so much pleasure meeting you, but we always kind of think of you, and, and I, we first met you, as Irv's life partner. Uh, and that was, you know, 20, 25 odd years ago, but by that time, I had known Irv for 20 years already. Uh, and this was kind of a new person, and, and I always think about uh, uh, the fact that, um, well, it's Irv's life partner, that's who it is. And, but it, and, and I, I want to emphasize that a little bit because, you know, one of the things that um, is really, really important is that when I first started, um, uh, there was this new uh, book out, there's this new study uh, in my first syllabi that I was getting together in university in the late 1970s, um, you know, there was a, a book that uh, uh, was, it was controversial at the time, and I remember my first Canadian Historical Association conferences, uh, there was some heated debate. 
But I remember the author of this, of this book uh, uh, was, was never heated. He always kept his cool. Uh, and, and he didn't necessarily say a lot, but what he said really was compelling. Uh, and then I had the real pleasure of, of meeting him as a colleague, uh, and I didn't know that we would become a, a longtime friends, and that it wasn't just his, his creation, uh, role as a founding editor of uh, a new journal in labor history, uh, Labor Le Travail, or, or uh, this book that was on my first uh, syllabi, but very quickly after that, 1983, there was another book that uh, um, we had to add to, um, sorry, there's a slide got missing here. Uh, we had to add, and of course, that was uh, known as, as too many. Now, this book was interesting because it, it was the first really serious truth-telling about anti-Semitism, uh, uh, I think, in our history. And, and I can remember it was, even though it, it got an awards right away, it won the Johnny McDonald Prize and so on, I can remember that when I uh, uh, um, allotted a week uh, to unpacking uh, what, what Irving had taught us, and we always call them Irv in the historical world. Uh, I know later that wasn't what everybody called him, but to us, he was always Irv. Um, uh, I remember a colleague telling me, you know, Chad, uh, you're giving a lot of time to, to that, that type. you know, you're doing the history, uh, Canadian history, uh, confederation to the present, uh, a week, you know, 13, you, you really can't do that. Um, and, and it was very controversial and, and the way uh, it was taught and we kind of forget that. Um, but I think a lot of us and certainly my generation really started to see this as a, as a kind of seminal work that was changing the paradigm of how we thought about, uh, thought about Canadian history. And, and I want to pick up on that today because, um, uh, you know, Irving goes on, obviously, in, and uh, he's not just a terrific scholar writing other books uh, that we should, uh, you know, got on to syllabi as well. But he also uh, became active, uh, whether it was in learned societies or in so many other uh, aspects of life. And the, and the phrase that really captures it for me is he started to show us what an engaged scholar can really do and the, and the difference that an engaged scholar could make. And I think uh, that was a real lesson and a real legacy for all of us in terms of the truth telling that we wanted to do about the past, at the same time to uh, feel that we were energized and able to make a difference. Um, and the way I think about his work, a theme that I want to pick up on tonight, in some ways, I think, I hope, uh, I know he's hopefully looking down at us. I want him to think that uh, uh, it, this lecture is kind of a tribute to his emphasis on the need to make what I think uh, is really an inclusive, to deal with the, all of Canadian history and to think about ourselves in an inclusive way whether it's his initial work on labor and the working classes and so on, later on anti-Semitism and the history of Jews and so on, he was telling us that we had to understand that we're not just adding in some others, this is how we're gonna understand the whole. And that sense of inclusive history, I think, is, is really at the heart of what we're still trying to do, a journey we're still on, and I hope, uh, thanks to his leadership and, and others, we're gonna keep going on. So that's sort of the context of, um, of, of my thoughts here tonight. Um, I want to thank uh, Greg Kelly and the Ideas folks for, for working with me on this. Uh, I was told I have to read this, and, uh, uh, and so thank you all again for coming. We're all thrilled and so on. Boucle vos ceintures de sécurité. Here we go. On the heels of a lethal pandemic and with multiplying floods, fires, and other extreme weather events, we're now being told that science fiction writers have been right all along, that artificial intelligence will soon be running our lives and potentially ruining them. With seemingly comprehensive data about everything we say or do, these applications, either invisibly or in intimidating machines, are said to be threatening to take over, disrupting all our institutions including our universities. The ultimate implication is that we risk becoming colonists in a global empire of bots, perhaps orchestrated by a few dictators. Have we lost control while we weren't paying enough attention? Is it too late to put the proverbial genie back in the bottle? 
As a historian who turned to computers in the mid-1970s, I see great benefits in technology. Like some other historians, I've used technology to reconstruct previously hidden histories, especially of those beyond the privileged people of the past. And personally, I'll admit it, GPS has made car travel more straightforward, reading the results and uh, aided uh, medical diagnostic tests more convincing, and learning about books or movies that I might like, sometimes inspired, although sometimes truly perplexing. And maybe an automated message to you, based on your past decisions, recommended that you listen to this talk today. <laughs> and for that, I'm grateful. But I've also become deeply concerned about the growing assumption that we live in a technologically driven world, and that the interrelationship of machines and minds has now tilted in favor of the machines. Such, such a concern has a long history, going back to the early days of digital computers. In 1961, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology launched a series of eight lectures to celebrate its centennial year. The series was initially entitled Management and the Computer of the Future. The ambition then widened to include the interests of society, government, science, and education. The Book of Conference Proceedings was entitled Computers and the Future of the World and, and the World of the Future. The lead organizer of the conference was a professor named Martin Greenberger. Greenberger was an MIT mathematician who'd helped establish the MIT Computation Center with IBM, which was now also funding the lecture series. The 33 who's who speakers ranged from Vannevar Bush and C.P. Snow to Herbert Simon and Norbert Wiener and Grace Hopper. Sprinkled among the scientists were a half dozen social scientists and one historian, MIT's Elton E. Morrison. Morrison's role was pivotal. He was brought to provide commentary to begin the panel discussion following C.P. Snow's opening lecture on scientists and decision making. Snow had republished his already widely discussed book, The Two Cultures and the Scientific Revolution, and his lecture repeated his condemnation of those he described as the intellectual Luddites of the day, who simply deplored the introduction of the machine. But now Snow was also concerned about something else, that the computer would lead to what he called a tiny circle of computer boys who would have unjustified decision-making power. Snow in the audience, quote, that the obvious and glaring danger is that the individual human judgment is going to take a part that will get smaller and smaller as the years go by. Then in beginning his commentary on Snow's presentation, the historian uh, Morrison told the audience, I do not know very much about the subject of, of these talks, the computer. However, he argued that his historical research on earlier technologies was directly relevant to the prominent threat of digital technologies. In 1950, Morrison had examined the contested inter introduction of continuous aim firing weapons in the United States Navy at the start of the 20th century. The widespread adoption of this new technology took three years, even though it was an obvious technical improvement over the established practice. Morrison's research showed that the status and rank of the gunnery officer rose significantly once continuous aim firing became the norm, and that this change, sta change in status upset the established hierarchy in Navy ships. He found that in anticipation of such changes, opposition to the proposed innovation coalesced quickly and was only eventually overcome by irresistible external pressure on the Navy's leadership. Morrison concluded that uh, history shows that, quote, in determining the kind of life you want to have, the instrumentation is less influential than the nature of the culture you create to control what you want to use the instruments for. From this perspective, he explained that C.P. Snow's fear of a tiny circle of computer boys with unprecedented power wrongly assumed that technology drives societal change. Instead, he pointed out that nothing in the nature of the computer will necessarily take us nearer to closed decisions. Closed decisions such as those taken in the days of Cardinals Wolsey and Richelieu or Caesar, long before there were radar sets or computers. In other words, the past teaches us that the crucial questions for the present and future are if, why, and how people choose to use new technologies. 
Today, I'm inviting to think through these crucial questions by focusing on a small number of historians who, imp who experimented with new technologies during the transition from print culture to the digital age. Their experience illustrate the extent to which some people immediately perceive both possibilities and challenges that we assume are associated with today's digital world. Their innovative thinking and initiatives reflected, collided, converged, and dissipated within the established order of the times. Only a few of them are remembered in 20th century histories, but their stories help us better understand what's happening and what's not happening today. In particular, we can see in looking back that their ambition was to redefine and practice historical scholarship in an increasingly inclusive way. Effective resistance to such inclusion by the mainstream discipline illustrates why we're still struggling today to think how to ensure that digital technologies are used only for human benefit and for the benefit of all. Fifteen years before the MIT lecture series, historians held the first session on technology that I've discovered at a learning, Learned Society conference. The session entitled New Technologies in Historical Research was held on December 28, 1946 at the annual meeting of the American Historical Association. The most important new technology discussed at this session was microphotography and the new miniature cameras that adapted motion picture film for continuous uh, imaging. The Leipzig Spring Fair in 1925 had featured the Leica One, which was followed by improved versions in subsequent years. Similarly, the Eastman Kodak Company had created their own research facilities during the earlier 20th century and were developing automated cameras taking photographs continuously on 16 millimeter film. The historians speaking at the conference session in 1946 lamented that historians were still largely ignoring these new technologies. In his paper, Microphotography for Scholars, Vernon D. Tate, historian and administrator at the National Archives in Washington, told the audience that, quote, somewhere scholarship has lost the ball. There has been much service on the part of scholars to microphotography and allied techniques and too little real understanding of them and their proper use. As an undergraduate in history at UCLA in the late 1920s, Tate had worked part-time in a camera store where he learned about Kodak's new Recordak process that had been invented for banks to preserve their records and was now becoming popular in businesses for administrative paperwork. Tate's part-time job experience paid off in an unexpected after he began his MA in history the following year. One of his professors hired him to assist during a research trip to Mexico. Rather than simply preparing to transcribe documents, Tate ingeniously brought a miniature camera to capture images in the archives. We don't know precisely how Tate photographed these documents, but we do know that by the early 1930s, various researchers had begun building their own makeshift ways to hold cameras in repositories in Europe as well as the United States. Adele Kibra, a medievalist who had received her PhD at the University of Chicago, recounted seeing, quote, philologists, paleographers, and art historians rapidly filming their research, research materials with miniature cameras at the Vatican Library in 1934. Kibra's research brought her to libraries and archives across Europe, where she usually found that each individual researcher depended on their own portable access. Such ingenuity uh, soon inspired companies to sell purpose-built units. The similarity between such units and the digital cameras on tripods that scholars use today is striking. One was called a modern automatic camera, uh, microfilm camera. It included extra lighting, as well as a table with a foot pedal for capturing images as the scholar come photographer turned pages. By the late 1930s, a research photograph of bound newspaper volume at 15 pages a minute. For his part, Vernon Tate's camera using experience in the Mexican archives led to a job offer in Washington, D.C., just after he completed his Ph.D. As the first chief of the Division of Photographic Reproduction and Research at the new United States National Archives in 1935, Tate defined mi microphotography, especially microfilm, as the most way for repositories to enhance long-term preservation and decentralized access to historical sources. His enthusiasm for microphotography was bolstered by President Franklin D. Roosevelt's official and personal interest in the new technology. 
Roosevelt visited the National Archives in 1937, where he spent time learning from Tate about new equipment, particularly for microfilming. Years later, Tate recounted that he and colleagues did quite a, quite a lot of photo and documentary work for him, sometimes involving trips to Hyde Park, hauling equipment in a truck. The resulting microfilm would become part of the first presidential library. As the Second World War began, Roosevelt promoted a microfilm with increased urgency, both domestically and internationally. On February 13, 1942, he reportedly explained that, quote, because of the conditions of modern war against which none of us can guess the future, it is my hope that it is possible to build up an American public opinion in favor of what might be called the only form of insurance that will stand the test of time. I am referring to duplication of records by modern processes like microfilm, so that if, if in any part of the country original archives are destroyed, a record of them will exist in some other place. In September uh, 1940, the United States Congress passed the law to accept microfilm as legal evidence. Mainstream historians certainly didn't oppose microfilming if absolutely necessary, but they insisted that genuine historical research depended on studying original documents. One argument was that a great deal of relevant uh, historical information could be lost in making an image of it argument among naysayers had some justification and one historian contacted the microphotography industry to encourage them to make products better suited to scholarly needs. Grace Lee Newt with a PhD in American history from Harvard gained employment at the Minnesota Historical Society's manuscript collection where she became one of the first state-level curators to prioritize microfilm as a way to preserve and provide access to their friends during the 1930s. In her work, she realized that scholars need specific technologies to take pictures in archives and to view the resulting microfilm, especially of manuscripts. Such requirements went beyond the priorities of companies such as Eastman that had begun to mass market small cameras to encourage families to capture events like their scenic vacations. In 1938, Grace Lee Newt wrote to the Recordat Company to explain that scholars require a microfilm reader capable of making a revolution of the image of the full 360 degrees, since writers use top, edges, and even the text of documents to write across at any and every angle. In surprising contrast to our frustration today with inaccessible companies, Recordac executives responded promptly. They offer Newt a model form of a reader still under development. To her pleasure, she said, it proved to be the best for our purposes of any model now available. Today, we consider such academic industry engagement highly innovative. My first collaboration with a computer company was in 2002, decades after I had started using their technology. The problem of influencing, uh, 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 the possibility of influencing a company's products never occurred to me, and I don't remember any of us complaining to each other about technological limitations. And earlier, when I began archival research in the 1970s, I never saw anyone with their own camera. We were all forced to rely on and pay for the repository-controlled photocopying or microfilming services. Only with the arrival of smartphones and their eventual acceptance by archives have researchers returned to directly making images during research trips. But let's return to the panel on new technologies at the AHA conference in 1946. The second presenter was Murray G. Lawson, a Canadian-born historian at City College of New York. He went even further than Vernon Tate in criticizing his peers. In a paper entitled The Machine Age in Historical Research, Lawson argued, quote, that historians have not been sufficiently conscious of the benefits derived from the technological revolution which has transformed uh, contemporary society. They have tended to putter along in the days of square-rigged ships. To bolster his critique of the conference, Lawson introduced a new reason for historians to turn to technology. Born in Toronto in 1915, Lawson had completed his BA and MA at the University of Toronto, writing his thesis on the fur trade under the influence of Harold Innes. By the time Innes is thinking about, by this time, Innes is thinking about economic, social, cultural, and technological change was evolving toward what became his book, Empire and Communications, published in 1950, and then his The Bias of Communication, published in 1951. 
In his his books explored how different kinds of communication media, including papyrus and paper, were linked to different kinds of social, economic, political organization. In his view, historical change is deeply complex, including the changing relationships between humans and the rest of the environment. The message was clear. Historians had to widen their research lens dramatically. As Innes' former student, two underlying questions were entangled in Lawson's mind. How to study the newly perceived complexity of historical change and enhance the practice of history for this purpose in light of new technological possibilities. We can assume that Harold Innes had suggested Murray Lawson go to Berkeley to study with Lawrence Harper, who was now chairing the session at the 1946 conference. Harper was an innovative historian, interested in historical and technological change, particularly the social, economic, and cultural impact of mercantilism and transatlantic trade. In his research, Harper aimed to do interpretive justice to the complexity of historical change by systematically studying large-scale historical sources. For this purpose, his ambition was to challenge, as he said, the proverbial cynic, who declared that history is the process whereby a complex truth becomes a simplified falsehood. <laughs> to avoid such simplification, Harper became two historians who began looking at the technology of punched cards, as they were called at the time. With this technology, a researcher could transform the writings on documents into coded representations on cards, which could then be systematically counted by electronic tabulating machines. This approach could be used for any individual project. It also made the pursuit of other projects possible if the punch cards uh, were made available to the larger community. But the notion that one scholar could use another scholar's research bucked the idea that historians were solitary scholars, each focused on their own endeavors, an assumption that Innes, Harper, and Lawson felt was no longer justified. In fact, Harper had recently uh, criticized the discipline using yet another metaphor. He asked, what revolutionary advances have the historian made? To put it bluntly, he has not advanced the horse and buggy days. In fact, he is still back in the pack mule era. For his part, Harper worried about, quote, the common tendency for each of us to narrow his field, to know more and more about less and less. And that narrowing, he emphasized, is no real solution to the recognition that historical change is deeply complex. The solution to our problem, he said, is to adopt new techniques. We should exploit the advantages which microphotography affords us by adapting the technique of digesting material and combining it, with, combining it with some method of sorting data, similar to those used by the international business machines. To convince skeptics in the audience whom he felt, quote, may say that the entire field of human knowledge, divided and subdivided as suggested, would be too tremendous. Harper claimed that the IBM technologies were up to the task. He calculated that each year of every individual's life could be subdivided under a trillion different classifications that could be assigned to microfilm documents by graduate and undergraduate students and then made searchable and easily accessible. In making this argument, Lawrence Harper then emphasized the key point that we're still coming to grips with today. He warned us, and his language here speaks directly to us, that technical inventions make changes whether we like them or not. He concluded, the question is whether we are to ride the quest of that wave to new heights of achievement or to be swamped by it. One unfortunate absence at the 1946 conference was Robert C. Binkley who had prematurely passed away in 1940, but whose name repeatedly came up at the session on technology. Binkley had interrupted his undergraduate program at Stanford University to join the United States military in World War I. Following the war, he stayed in Europe, funded by a donation from Herbert Hoover, who, uh, helped, uh, who to help collect war-related material that was at risk of destruction, dispersal, and decay. In this particular kind of work, Binkley learned firsthand about the fragility of documents. This insight would pin his future academic career, beginning as a graduate student working part-time as a reference librarian in the Hoover War Library. After graduation, Binkley pursued his research and teaching on European history starting in 1927 at New York University and then at Case, Case Western Reserve University where he worked as a professor of history until his death. 
As a professor, Binkley combined his research in teaching on European history with leadership and initiatives to use new technologies and historical scholarship. One of his first objectives was to facilitate the study of historical documents by first-year undergraduates. Binkley would explain that, quote, our state-centered political history as learned in the schools is out of focus with life. Life values will be reflected only in the historical writing that portrays the world as we see it in our own lives, from the human center of our families, from the graphic center of our homes. Binkley first pursued this ambition by introducing his undergraduate students to original historical documents in the nearby New York Public Library. However, his initiative exposed the vulnerability of documents even in dedicated repositories. The librarian soon became concerned that the historical material was being read to pieces, as they reported, when replacement is difficult, if not impossible. The documents, like certain natural preserves today, were in danger of being viewed to death. Binkley saw technology as offering a solution. What if students could study evidence on microfilm that could be copied repeatedly for classrooms anywhere? From Binkley's perspective, the technology could improve preservation and increase access to complete copies of original historical material. However, mainstream historians agree. Binkley's approach questioned the established pedagogy in, in history curricula of the time. The assumption was that only after four undergraduate years of discussion and debate about how credentialed historians view the past could a student begin developing their own projects and graduate programs. Binkley's call for curriculum reform was ignored in the larger uh, disciplinary culture. In fact, Binkley's most supportive writer was his wife, Frances Williams Binkley. By the 1930s, Frances Binkley, who had been a receptionist in the Hoover War Library, had become an expert in using cameras and archives and libraries while working for free, as her husband noted. Her talent with camera settings and films didn't escape some outside recognition. The Leica Company asked her uh, to write a chapter on copying books and maps in their instructional manual for the amateur and professional covering the entire field of Leica photography, published in 1937. Meanwhile, troubling events in the 1930s Germany were deepening, deepening the Binkley's conviction that technology could expand historical scholarship for society's benefit. Robert Binkley began publicly arguing that imaging technologies would permit broad access to archival material on students and professional scholars. His idea was that access to microfilm historical documents in local communities would help balance the centralizing cultural authority of national repositories that only privileged scholars could ever visit. When German President Paul von Hindenburg appointed Nazi party leader Adolf Hitler as chancellor in 1933, Binkley began writing his most important statement. Published in 1935 in the Yale Review as New Tools for Men of Letters, Binkley's article described a new model of technology-enabled historical scholarship that could cultivate substantive connections between campuses and communities and therefore strengthen societal cohesion. Binkley observed, quote, that from Germany today comes a lesson of what things may be possible when cultural centralization is too great and its apparatus is ruthlessly used. From his perspective, this danger increased the urgency and importance of embracing the new technologies to enable community-based initiatives that would connect citizens with their past. Binkley explained that, quote, the new graphic arts devices are, I believe, capable of working the other way. As, as, as implements for a more decentralized and less professionalized culture, a culture of local literature and amateur scholarship. By making microfilm copies of documents available for consultation across the United States, Binkley believed that everyday citizens would be better able to connect their own experience to those who'd lived in earlier periods. His point was simple but powerful. Such connections would cultivate a locally rooted sense of national belonging that would in turn help thwart potentially centrally controlled anti-democratic ambitions. And together with the educational and scholarly advantages, this potentially social role convinced Binkley that technology-enabled positive transformative change was possible and should be embraced by historians. This is why he began his article in 1935 by declaring, there is, taking, there is taking place in the techniques of record and communication a series of changes more revolutionary in their possible impact upon culture than the invention of 
You won't be surprised now to know that Binkley's claim wasn't well received by colleagues. In fact, historians were continuing to professionalize the discipline during the 1930s by drawing uh, stronger boundaries around their own expertise, especially through organizations like the American Historical Association and the Canadian Historical Association. Binkley recognized that, quote, there is always much shaking of heads in the universities over the question of serious work from the amateur. From the mainstream perspective, only credentialed historians who could personally visit archives should interpret the past. Now suppose we fast forward to the 1960s when we can find a slowly increasing number of historians turning to technology. One of the most important was Michael Katz, who began his doctoral work at Harvard in, in the fall of 1963, two years after the MIT lectures. One of his first seminars was taught by Daniel Calhoun, who was on his way to becoming a leading historian in the United States. In looking back, Katz vividly remembered his surprise when Calhoun told the students that computers would become significant tools in historical research and that therefore they had to use them in undertaking their seminar projects. Remember, 1963. This prospect was daunting for Katz. He admitted that as someone who three was a way to avoid math, I was terrified and completely at sea. Much to his surprise, Katz would be joining a new generation of scholars who, while modest in number, would boost computer-assisted historical scholarship by the early 1970s. This generation was the first to learn how to use computers during academic courses, and they continued helping tilt the discipline towards inclusive history through continued uh, resistance and controversy. Several of them emerged as international leaders while holding academic appointments in Canada, where well-established and brand new universities were competing successfully in a booming job market. As Katz described it, demography may not be destiny, but being on the right side of it sure helps. <laughs> After receiving three offers for full-time positions, Katz chose the Department of History at the University of Toronto and its newly opened Ontario Institute for Studies and Education. With a joint appointment, Katz could benefit from the energy and innovative ambition of a new academic unit, while also joining a department that included emerging leaders in social history, including those who were experimenting with computers. The historian and sociologist Charles Tilley had arrived on campus in 1965 and was joined by Edward Shorter in 1967. They would soon embark on a computer-enabled study of strikes in France from 1930 to 19. The rapid, extent, uh, the rapid ascent of the University of Toronto as an international leader in digitally enabled historical research was also accelerated by the arrival of social and cultural historians using interdisciplinary approaches to historical change that acknowledged, though did not involve computers. These historians included Natalie Zeman Davis and Jill Kerr Conway, who were both teaching in the history department by 1964. In the following years, Davis and Conway became founding members of the new research field of women's history. Davis's doctoral students included Louise Tilly, who had also become a leading uh, scholar of interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary history, cultivating research on uh, women, work, and family life, including attention to computer-enabled historical demography. The academic ambitions of this first generation of technology accepting graduates illustrate the changing relationship between historical practice and social context. In the case of technology use, this relationship was quite different from its earlier articulations during the previous decades. While historians during the 1930s and 40s had seen mechanical aids in history as a way to strengthen social cohesion and commitment to Western democracies, and in the 1960s, scholars were more likely to use computers to challenge the dominant top-down narrowness on the thoughts and actions of the elite. A central ambition now was to reveal and explain the roots of social inequality and to inspire engagement off campus to support corrective policies and programs. It was in this larger context that Irving Abella helped create the new field of labor history, first with his dissertation and then with helping found a new historical journal, as well as many other activities. For his contribution, Michael Katz would become a national leader in the field that would soon be called history and computing. Thanks to financial support, especially at OISE, Katz became the principal investigator of an innovative research project devoted to studying mid-19th century Hamilton, Ontario, as an example of the social and economic meaning of inequality for the laboring classes during commercialization and urbanization. 
In using computers for his research, Katz would attract some students while also confronting explicit resistance as well as passive aggressive behavior among detractors. The result by the 1970s and 80s was that those historians who took seriously the potential of new technologies to enable a more inclusive understanding of the past remained on the edge of the mainstream discipline. Their importance did grow, especially in certain settings such as Quebec and in new journals and scholarly associations were formed that attracted participants in Canada, the United States, and Europe. However, controversy and active resistance in the discipline continued. Robert C. Binkley had predicted in 1936 that, quote, just as the scholars of the last generation found in general that it was desirable to be able to use the, computer, uh, the typewriter, so the scholars in the next generation will find it necessary to use photography. When the next generation arrived, history didn't suggest that students should learn to use a camera as part of the historian's toolkit. The dominant culture of history as a discipline did not embrace genuine undergraduate research or respect the potential of what we now call citizen science. No one I knew took history courses in the early 1970s that invited them to use technology to think about what was being gained and lost, how machines would affect our, our work in both intended and unintended uh, ways. In 1968, the innovative French historian Emmanuel Lacroix Ladery predicted the historian will be a programmer or he will be nothing. In the mid 1970s, when I was learning how to code in the early, not so user friendly software applications to study historical documents, most historians, at best, barely tolerated such exotic activity. When I was a new prof in the early 1980s, one seasoned colleague warned that I was at risk of being seen as a numerologist rather than as a promising historian. So in taking technology seriously, we must keep in mind that the past reminds us repeatedly, as historian Eltine Morrison had emphasized in 1961, that the most important questions for the relationship between minds and machines are if, why, and how people choose to use new technologies. We ignore development at our peril. By 1939, IBM technology, including punch guards, were widely used by the Nazis to identify and track those, especially the Jews, whom they identified as enemies, and then to organize the Holocaust. Today, we often unthinkingly agree to digitally enabled surveillance of our everyday lives by governments, companies, and diverse individuals and groups, perhaps to get questions for movies or to track changes in our quantitative selves. But are we critically examining where such surveillance has gone in the past, and are we relentlessly insisting on appropriate guardrails? In the later 1960s, Natalie Zeman Davis and Jill Kerr Conway didn't turn to computers in their academic work, but they did as campus leaders for progressive changes, such as equal pay for men and women. Con Conway recalled it. To the astonishment of the action team, the central administration cheerfully handed over the computer records on, of faculty salaries. And one of our statistical experts from the psychology department set about analyzing them. The computer-enabled results helped Davis and Conway in their fight against institutional patriarchy with some positive results. But the human benefits from, some, from such data transparency in universities would be short-lived and only partially resuscitated years later. The winter before uh, we started at McGill University in 1969, students protesting institutional racism had occupied the nearby computer center of what was then named uh, Sir George uh, Williams University. In making this choice, the students recognized that the administration was not using computers for positive change. After 14 days, police stormed the center, culminating in the arrest of 97 protesters and the destruction of $2 million in computer equipment, the result of a fire that students said was lit by the police. On October 28, 2022, Concordia University made an official apology for what became known as the computer riots, admitting that the university's actions and inactions were a stark manifestation of institutional racism. All of which points me back to the year 1950, when Alan Turing asked, can machines think, and proposed how this capability could be ascertained. Turing predicted that by the year 2000, programmers would be able to make it quite difficult for humans to tell if they were conversing with a computer human. 
he concluded with, quote, a hope that machines will eventually compete with men in all purely intellectual fields. As you know, we have only recently begun to pay serious attention to what such competition might mean for humanity. And this prospect no longer inspires unqualified hope. The good news is that significant positive change is finally underway. In history, critically informed initial change from curriculum reform to new programs and policies. Today, undergraduate history students might use primary sources to create apps for augmented reality visits to local historical sites. They might text mine a digital corpus of 19th century newspapers to study the spread of forest fires in rural areas or of contagious diseases in cities. They might do so in conjunction with digitized land records or hospital documents or DNA evidence forensic research. Similarly, historians are now forging connections between campuses and communities thanks to the acceptance of, of concepts like co-creation and, finally, engaged scholarship. Digital history, as we now call the field, has become widely recognized in Canada. Building on the early, though limited, achievements of the 1960s and 70s, Canada now ranks among the leading countries in the cross-disciplinary and cross-sectoral digital humanities. In 2015, the American Historical Association published guidelines for the professional evaluation of digital scholarship by historians in belated re recognition of the fact that, as the guidelines stated, as the guidelines stated Disciplines and universities have emerged two centuries ago in a profusion of print. They now find themselves confronted with new digital forms. Of course, the discipline of history is only one example of how disciplines have, uh, to a greater or lesser extent, become digitally enabled over the years, often with positive, transformative results, but almost never with adequate critical assessment. In 2018, seven decades after serious consideration could have been begun about the uh, nexus of, means, uh, uh, of machines and minds, artificial intelligence researchers like the socially engaged Yashua Bengio developed the Montreal De Declaration for Responsible AI Development. This statement calls for, quote, a national and international forum for discussion to collectively achieve equitable, inclusive, and ecologically sustainable AI development. In July this year, the Russell Group of leading research universities in the United Kingdom identified principles on the use of generative AI tools in education. Taken together, these examples of recent action are encouraging, and they also emphasize how much work we have to do. If we had taken seriously technologies like microphotography, we could have had a head start on thinking through the far more powerful digital technologies. The most important historical lesson is that the nexus of machines and minds is never benign. It demands our attention, and that attention has to be constant. The bad news is that the question of digital seems to be everywhere and too often nowhere on our campuses in terms of responsibility and accountability. In my own historical work, as well as through my experience in academic and research organizations, I have become convinced that the digital question cuts horizontally across the vertical structures, policy assumptions, and practices of higher education that were developed over a century in analog print-based cultures. I think historical precedents make it clear that we cannot rely on any one specific discipline or knowledge system to show the way forward toward a digitally enabled, just, resilient, and inclusive world. It's now more important than ever that we learn from the past. In her convocation address last spring upon receipt of an honorary doctorate at the University of Saskatchewan, Justice Rosie Abella described how knowledge tasks can energize us to confront today's daunting challenges. I admit that we still have a lot to do, she said, and smugness should never be on the national agenda. But let's focus today on what we've earned the right to feel proud of. Canada's justice journey so far, and why we need to cherish the ever-increasing Canadian trajectory towards a more and more inclusion, fairness, and social justice, so that the next generation can look backward and forward with the same pride and hope we feel today. Justice Abella's words resonate with historical evidence that, with determined and energized collective effort, we can develop ethical principles, public policies, and regulatory guardrails to optimize the digital revolution for the benefit of humanity. At stake is our ability to create the inclusive future we want, the future that will make our descendants look back on us with pride, feeling that we did all we could to make a better world for all.
to dare ask very good <laughs> questions. And you, you, you deserve a glass of Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> So first of all, thank you for uh, your wonderful remarks today. Thank you. Could you talk about either in a historical context or just talk about the, what's happening today with regard to ownership of technology and then the use of it and how we in a capitalist society uh, allow individuals or corporations to own technology and its rights and maybe even point to a couple of things like uh, recently, Elon Musk turning on and off uh, the internet uh, affected uh, Ukraine very directly recently. That's such a great question, and thank you very much. Uh, it really illustrates, I think, the, the, the something that struck me in so many cases is that uh, we did not appreciate, and I would say back even to the earlier technologies, the extent to which technologies cut horizontally across a lot of the vertical structures. So in other words, we've, uh, through the recent centuries, have seen the world in terms of dividing it in terms of, say, home, school, work, uh, your country, my country, and so on. Uh, and it, every which way we can think about it, they're vertical uh, structures. Now, we all need vertical structures to live our lives. That's, it's, it's obviously essential. But the key now in the 21st century, we know, is we have to connect horizontally because things are interrelated. And, and I think what we see with, with that case is uh, digital is, is, is really put on steroids, the notion that technology can cut right across. And so in terms of all those vertical structures, it just goes right through them. And so whoever controls that then is now in a position uh, to do what a lot of our policies and, and, and structures and so on can't do anymore because they're all vertical. And, and to try to get us to collectively worry about something that goes beyond our boundaries. Uh, and so, I mean, it's so interesting uh, how the discipline of history, for example, was, was trying to professionalize and draw stronger boundaries around it, like other disciplines, actually, uh, at a time when everything we were learning about the world functions, about how humans function and so on, was telling us that we have to think about it in interconnected ways. And that's why Innes is so important and, and still is so important because he started to see that. He saw that uh, we can't just uh, uh, keep it divided. And so now we get amazingly powerful people uh, in positions uh, to, to influence in, in really complex ways uh, why? Because uh, the rest of us are, are just unable to reach across uh, and deal effectively. And uh, it's, a, it's a really, really serious problem. Uh, and I think, you know, a lot of the 20th century was an attempt to try to get the world together, or to, to work together, and to create these boundaries and alliances and so on. And I worry right now that, in fact, you know, we're almost kind of going the other way now, in a weird kind of a way. And I, and I think... The phrase that I like a lot is, in, in the campus world, I like to call it discipline-based interdisciplinarity. So in other words, we want the, the strength of specialization, we want the, uh, the strength of that vertical, but it's got to be done in that larger context. Uh, we know it in the world of health, we know it in, in just so many sectors. Curriculum today still is struggling with the notion that we are going to create individuals who think in ways that combine the best of, of that vertical and that horizontal. Music to my ears, interdisciplinary, yeah. again, <laughs> from an historical perspective. Uh, une autre question, and uh, we. Uh, first of all, that was extraordinary. Oh, thank I, you. Every time I see you, hear you, I understand why you were so deeply loved by the team. Oh. So I, my question follows on Bruce's because I think it raises, and you responded, some um, concerns. When we talked about the development, the evolutionary development of an understanding of the importance of research and how to capture it, Bruce talked about the problem of individuals controlling information. And as you said, there are no borders anymore. Information for historians is global and there's nobody in charge of deciding what facts are anymore and what truth is anymore. So when you've got um, a global phenomenon and you've got anti
anti-regulatory uh, an anti-regulatory site site guys in the country that has the most uh, most of the control over these uh, pieces of information that you want as an historian use and that the world wants not to have improperly used as Nazi Germany is a perfect example. What then do we do about how it's now gone out of control and there's nobody able, even if willing, to make sure that there are truth borders, communication borders, ethical borders, there are principles, but there's no enforcement. Is, is there a solution or we're just going to have to work our way through? It's such a great question, and it's certainly one I think uh, is in many ways at the heart of the 21st century. Uh, and my response is, we just don't have a choice. And I think we got to take some uh, hope and inspiration from history. When there were people early on who, be you know, who began to think about what it would be like to uh, try to cultivate and in engage the connection between a person's sense of, of, of belonging in a particular community and so on, and that sense of a larger community and so on. And they thought about, okay, well, if we can get them, make accessible uh, kind of documents and so on. And you hear this now, something like Ancestry.com is, is really making a lot of money out of all that, because what are they doing? They're allowing people to uh, put themselves in the picture and to think about their own histories and so on. With, but, but if this is a, a corporation doing it, frankly, in ways that, you know, is the collective good there? Is it, are they fostering something that's designed in the way it would be, I think, if it were seen and held and controlled in the public sector and not just businesses doing it? So we've kind of ceded to um, basically money-making enterprises uh, a lot of the key um, levers that we might have to get control of this. Can we get that genie back in the bottle? You know, I believe that history says we have to, because if you think about it, you know, if you think about when, when, when Irv was launching his career, and, and certainly when I was launching my career, over the while there's no doubt about it that history today and the way we think about it and teach about it is more inclusive. I think we're doing a better justice in, in, to uh, the past and how we're thinking about this. We have a world to go, uh, and obviously in terms of our efforts now to come uh, to grips in a really substantive way with indigenization and so on, there, this, is, this is a never-ending journey. But at least that, I think, kind of compels us to recognize that uh, if we think about who we are and relate with, to others uh, and, and, and how we're going to build a better future, we cannot give over to the private sector uh, technology in particular these days. We just cannot do it, and we have to think it through. And there are efforts being made now. I know in Ottawa we're talking about it. As an historian, I say, if we had started thinking through these technologies earlier that were really far less powerful and so on, but the issues were there. You know, the same kind of uh, issues were there. If we had started then, we would have had a head, you know, we would, we would be more optimistic today. We're playing catch up, but obviously I think we can. I think it's going to take a collective effort. And I think all of our institutions, all of our policies and, 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 and so on, we cannot simply tug on the blanket in terms of our own view of it. We have to collectively think about how we can make a better world. Wise words to uh, and uh, lecture. Uh, you know, question to Anastasia. Did you want to, do you mind coming mm. to the... Hey, Jess. Just following on to Jess's analogous question, I don't know if groundwork for optimism. <laughs> Technology and before in history, yes, and there was a lag, yes. right? But this one is moving faster, and the incapacity of the state as a regulator is astonishing. There's almost nobody inside government, very, very few, 
even in better equipped countries than ours, who has the technological know-how to do the job even if the political will were there. So it's not a question of political will. There are huge asymmetries in knowledge. And for the first time, it is the private sector that is the leading producer. I mean, it was true about electricity, it was true about the steamship, so it's not new, but we didn't have this asymmetry in knowledge, which is absolutely crippling um, in terms of state capacity to regulate. Where's your optimism? <laughs> well, okay, so I, I totally agree with you. However, let's, let's go here. You know, uh, why is it that uh, when generative AI comes out and so on, we have this huge knowledge gap. Well, part of it is, I think, for uh, reasons, historical reasons, we decided that uh, the, un the handling of words and the handling of numbers were totally different things. We should use in parts of campus, and no one really ever had to be comfortable uh, with them both. You know, and even though, you know, semiotically speaking, uh, words and numbers are both representations of perceived reality, they're different languages, why can't we uh, treat this? So, so uh, and even with generative AI, you know, um, it's, it's, when you think about uh, the importance of understanding what it's based on, uh, it's a black box for most people, when in fact it's created by a, a group out of you know, basically what people said and uh, wrote in the past. And, and, you know, well, why don't we teach that our schools? Why do we allow things to be all put such that at the end we have, back to the vertical structures, we have specialized people with specialized knowledge, but that don't really have an understanding of us and, and don't have the language even to access. And we think it's okay. It's like cats, you know, arriving and saying, well, I, history, because I don't like math. Like, we can't allow that, that's, that's crazy. Uh, uh, words are learning a language, numbers are learning a language. Like, let's say that, and I would say across and on and on, learning about different knowledge systems and so on. So I think if we committed ourselves, and you know, hey, universities, we're pretty big institutions. If we said, look, we're gonna stop uh, letting uh, people all become very specialized in their corners, and we're gonna stop thinking that what we're doing here is we're training them for their first job. And instead, we're gonna educate them, I would say for every job they're ever gonna have, but do it in ways that embrace uh, the actions, the multiple languages and so on, and prepare people to think about, not just to have, a, a, you know, not just to have acquired a lot of knowledge, but to have acquired a way of thinking, uh, ways of thinking, uh, a, a kind of a mindset that would allow people to, I think, start to develop the policies and practices and so on. So, you know, I always start, you know, with our community, I always say, let's start with ourselves. Uh, and I think, I know there are efforts on all our campuses uh, to do this, uh, but it is urgent. And I think we have to accelerate it. Um, and maybe uh, chat GPT is, is gonna be the thing that's really gonna get us there. Um, better late than never. So uh, I'm with others in thanking you for the terrific insights, but um, uh, your reference earlier to alternate facts reminded me of, I think, what is the most destabilizing and uh, sometimes terrifying idea, and that is as we rely on digital records more and more, the stability of what is a record, uh, its ability to resist manipulation, to be static and not dynamic over time, uh, is, uh, seems to be a challenge unlike the previous ones, although certainly forgeries are nothing new. Uh, as a judge, it, it you know, wouldn't occur to me that a case I'm relying on and that other judges have relied on for 80 years could some day tomorrow be a different decision with different words, uh, with the same form and the same claim to be a precedent on which we are governed. Uh, so if you transpose that to the deep fake, there are ways in which uh, the generative and uh, you know, AI tools are being used for creative and uh, sometimes amazing and astounding feats of technology, there is clearly this dark uh, potential for a record, an idea, something we have seen with our own eyes, not to be captured in that way or to be captured and then altered for, again, uh, in service 
goals over which we have no regulatory body that can say, no, no, that's not true anymore. So does that keep you up at night? Uh, and if not, uh, why not? <laughs> It's, uh, it's, it's such, such a great point because I think, I think as uh, the talk today basically suggested is that the thinking, the new mindset, the innovative kind of thinking was way ahead of the technology 70 years ago, 80 years ago, 50 years ago. And now the technology is way ahead of uh, our ability to kind of think this through in any kind of, of, of reasonable way. There's no doubt about it, that notion of permanence uh, the, that notion of fixed, um, you know, in this talk today, I got to revise it up until the time we walked in here, and uh, 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 now everything's live, it's posted, and uh, when, you know, and so on. So uh, that, that notion of fixed has become uh, a whole different uh, a kind of, 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 of issue. Uh, and similarly, you know, in terms of what's being captured, alternative facts, that what's lost when you, when you have a, an image of something. And this is, you know, Grace Lee Newt in the 1930s was thinking about this. What's lost in, when we take a, uh, an image in the archive of a document and how can we uh, change the technology and make it more uh, appropriate in terms of capturing the full, as much as we can, the full robust. Uh, so if those kind of, kind of conversations had really developed and continued, I think we'd be a world better off today. Is it too late now? Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, we are having to really, really uh, work hard to even imagine catching up. Uh, but I believe we have to say we're going to do it. Uh, because what are the alternative? I, I, I agree, you know, we could be colon, uh, colonists in an empire of bots run by a few, a few dictators. That is a is possibility. However, I think we have to say to each other and, and hopefully our kids and so on, that we did absolutely everything we could to ensure that, uh, uh, or, or at least to try to work toward that not happening. And so this is, a, you know, I think another call to action um, that I think in a lot of ways goes back to what Irving Abella was trying to do and, 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 and drawing our attention to, to uh, the working class and labor, what he was trying to do and to our attention to the impact of anti-Semitism uh, and, and the kind of, of histories that were not part of our story in Canada and so on. Um, it's, uh, it's more urgent now maybe than ever, um, but I just don't think we have a choice but to uh, embark on it now. Thank you very much. You're all invited to uh, join us for a reception in the upper library, which is just behind us. So thank you thank again. Thank you all so much. Thank you.